helping CEOs and business leaders discover the energy to perform exceptional brilliance and positively impact the lives of those around them. Be inspired by world leaders and next level gurus. This is the Active CEO Podcast, where the ordinary don't belong. And now your hosts, Craig Johns and Ben Gathercole. So Ben, welcome to the Active CEO Podcast. Uh, today's uh, it's our first episode, so a bit of fun, quite exciting. Exciting times. I know we've spoken about this for quite a while and it's something that's really a, a deep passion of both of ours. Uh, we certainly um, want want the best for people and, and leadership in, in the CEO area is uh, an area that we've both had some experience in and I think is uh, really um, probably an underutilised uh, space where we can actually help some people. So really excited to come on board and, and uh, impart our knowledge if that's what you want to call it. Yeah, I think with both of us through our journeys, we've experienced a lot of CEOs and a lot of people that you know, run themselves into the ground. They, they think they're producing performance or, or high quality workplaces but a lot of the time they that is pushing the boundaries too far they're not getting that rest and recovery so you know for us I think I suppose a big question to kick this off is you know for you what are some of those things that you see are missing in the workplace that we've been able to really do well in the sporting field yeah thanks um, Craig I absolutely acknowledge that and I would think from my experience uh, it's making sure you have the time and the time to learn and grow and work with your people. Because at the end of the day, um, the people of your organisation are really the, the value to your organisation. Uh, so you've got to have the time as a CEO, uh, I guess for want of a better term, the headspace as a CEO, uh, to um, engage with your people and get the best from your people. And to get the best from your people, you actually have to get the best from yourself. And to get the best from yourself, that's a pretty tough ask under today's, you know, economic environment in, in the workplace. Oh, there's still a lot of people out there that continue to think that the more hours I put in, the more work I do, the, the more results we're going to get. And Certainly, yeah. you know, those 60-hour work weeks, absolutely. But you, you commonly hear people uh, um, move over into the 70, 80-hour type work weeks all the time. And that, you know, to me, that's just not acceptable. And you're being, you're certainly... Um, um, being counterproductive if you're working that long. So I think, you know, sure, those 50, 60 hours, they're, they're the hours that you have to work sometimes, uh, but I wouldn't think on a consistent basis. No, and I think that's, you know, we see that all too often and we see it with athletes too mm. who, you know, push the boundaries and go week on week on week of 30 to 40 hours a week and they're burning out and I see it the same in, in the CEOs and, you know, even right down to the junior level inside the workforce and I know I've done it myself and I wouldn't go, you know, I wouldn't, you know, if I do a 70, 80 hour week, which you've got to do sometimes, I'll always plan ahead to make sure that I've got recovery time in there, that it's time away or that following week it's reduced hours so I can get that mental uh, refreshness back. I can make sure that physically I feel really well too, that when we walk back into the office, that we're giving the 100% energy and, and dedication to ensuring that our staff are in a great environment to be able to perform well. Yeah, totally agree. And I know in the sports environment and that's something that you've uh, adhered to over time too is you use the periodization concept and periodization is about sure larger periods of work but planning as you've just been saying about um, less time of work or recovering or adapting to the work process uh, so to speak so I think that's a really big concept and it's something that we're both keen to expand on and help um, people on. Yeah no that's something we're really going to expand out mm -hmm. over the the series of episodes that we put together so I, I think you know, maybe it's a good time now to talk a little bit about what the podcast is going to be and, and some of you might be interested in in our slogan and, and what that all means and you know we, we're sort of bouncing off different ideas and we come up with uh, where the ordinary don't belong and you know what was the what was your first reaction when you saw that yeah like it's it's certainly very catching to me you, you look at it and go where the ordinary don't belong right and the truth is that leaders and CEOs are, are not ordinary people um, the pressures, the uh, circumstances you're under, the decision making you have to make consistently uh, is not for the ordinary person. And I think it's a, uh, just a, an area where um, when, you, when you write the ordinary don't belong, it just catches your attention. And, and I can only give you credit for, for coming up with something like that. Um, it's something to delve into and really excited about. Yeah, you know, something I suppose epitomizes both of us where. 
you know, throughout the years, we, we're not people that like to do what someone else is doing. We like to challenge it. We like to think outside, you know, the, the term outside the box, but we're really thinking forward and going, okay, well, how's this going to look and how can we put things in place to ensure that we can deliver those things in the future? Well, I think that, you know, some of those other uh, phrases that you have with the energy to perform and uh, things like that are um, massively important here. And that's what it's about. As a, as a true CEO, you have to perform. And thinking about things like periodization and workload and work-life balance and all those sorts of catchphrases, so, yeah, are very important. But, you know, I still go back to that where the ordinary don't belong. It's a very catchy and very true phrase. Yeah, I'd, you know, there's a lot of people in the world that kind of just roll on with life, but... You know, I think when they see that slogan, they're all like, no one wants to be mediocre. No one wants to be ordinary. So it makes them think a little bit and go, hey, you know what? I, I don't want to be classified in that. So how do I belong? What, what can I do to change the way I do things? You know, it's very much like our, our title too, the active CEO. I really like that. Um, to me, that catches the essence of, of, of the next generation CEO. You, you're active in chasing these things um, in, in the football sense, so I come from, uh, um, lucky enough, come from a football background and a triathlon background, um, we always talk about being proactive rather than reactive. And world-leading CEOs are proactive CEOs. They're not reactive CEOs. It's a really important point to make. And I know we've got listeners from all around the world here, so we better cl- um, clarify quickly what football is. So they, for those from different parts of the world, that means rugby union in our world yep. down here in New Zealand and Australia. Australia. Yep. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about energy and performance. So maybe let's go back quite a way. Uh, what got you into, or sorry, what was your first career and, and how, did you, how, did that, how did you get into that space to where you are now? Yeah, that's, uh, look, to be honest, uh, I, I, grew up, I was lucky enough to grow up in, on the northern beaches in Australia and uh, that was sort of an active endurance sport hub uh, through the late 70s and early 80s and uh, I was certainly fortunate enough to learn from my family about coaching and leadership. Um, and I grew into a, a coaching business, coaching um, and developed um, athletes that went to Olympic, Commonwealth Games, World Championship level through my 25 odd years of coaching. Uh, so that, that's how I originally got involved. Uh, and that's how I started to teach myself about leadership. Not only did I teach myself, but I had the, um, the fortunate experience of uh, being mentored by plenty of really good leaders around uh, different sports. So I was really fortunate in that area. Uh, from there, you know, and, and it's a little bit similar to your background, um, being from um, New Zealand, you know, really adventure, adventurous, endurance sport background, but real, um, I guess, out of the box or real leaders. Uh, so I think we're really fortunate in those backgrounds and learned from people through surf life saving, swimming, triathlon, rugby. Um, I know that you were quite involved with hockey uh, those sort of sports, you know, really pushing the boundaries of, of learning and leading and uh, creating something different. Yeah, so I think you first, you know, you went off to America as a, as a swimmer and you had the opportunity when you first come back to Australia to be a teacher. Um, you know, what, what inspired you to be a teacher to begin with? Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I'd probably be rude enough to say that I just sort of fell into that. But it doesn't take very long as a teacher to, to figure out that um, it's a pretty cool thing to do to be able to impart your knowledge on, on young people. And I certainly still enjoy that today, 35 years on from that initial career. Um, and I think um, my mum, who's 81, uh, still teaches aquatic education every day. So it's wow. certainly, certainly in my blood. Um, I still work with her on a daily basis. Uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to see and she, uh, I guess through her, I would have learned that, that ongoing passion for uh, continuing education. So you got to see your, your dad work with a number of Olympic athletes and some went on to win gold and silver medals at Olympic Games in the 50s and 60s and then later on with a number of the Australian teams. You know, he would have worked with the likes of Forbes Carlyle, Doc Councilman, who are... Who are sort of the, the godfathers yeah. and the pioneers, the pioneers of the swimming world. Yeah. You know, so, so you would have seen him do that as a youngster. Mm. What was some of the things that you learned from him that you were like, oh, wow, you know what, I'm going to do that differently because I don't want to burn out or yeah. I want to make sure that I'm delivering the best environment I can every day. Uh, so probably two things that I learned from that, Craig, was, and it's something that I would love to pass on to 
CEOs is um, to be humble. And when you're humble, you open yourself to the ability to learn and pass on information. And those pioneers and in, in the people that I was able to see, uh, particularly my father, were very humble, humble coaches and educators and, and men per se. Uh, and that really opened up their ability to be the very best they can be. And in my later careers, uh, you certainly see CEOs now that are not open and humble enough to learn to go forward. So I think one of the things I'd like to see or like to pass on is that ability to be humble in your workplace. Um, and if you're humble in the workplace, well, the uh, truth is you've got to be humble in your life to be humble in the workplace. So this, we'll just uh, stop it there real quick. And you know, for the listeners, a really good take-home point there. So being humble and not just in the workplace, but in your home life as well. You've got to have that integrity and, and be open and be willing to not only share, but also to learn and receive at the same time. So a very powerful point there. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I'd I, I, you know, sort of turn it back on you a little bit because I know you had a fairly similar upbringing, but there would have been leaders that you grew up with that were quite humble and you learnt from. Oh, extremely so. And uh, I think probably my first leaders, I come from you know, a sporting family as well. My dad's side of the family, granddad and dad were both provincial hockey coaches and, and very successful in turning teams that were struggling to begin with into winning teams. Um, and then from my mum's side of the family, they're very involved in cricket. And so also provincial coaches and uh, very, you know, still, still got records, I think, in some of the cricketing circles back there. So very fortunate to have both those sides. So we're extremely competitive. Yeah. And it, any Christmas time, any gathering, I can tell you, we were pushing the boundaries every time to get that one up on each other. So we had that very competitive environment. But I think... But, but in saying that, though, being competitive and being humble... You need a nice mix of that. You oh. can't be one side or the other. And I think we can probably see that quite recently in the Australian cricket team, which has just had a big big blow up with uh, their, I guess, you wouldn't say cheating, but certainly probably not playing in the spirit of the game. Um, and everyone now perceives they've pushed the, the ideal of winning too far over the edge. Oh, and they've brought it right back the other way. Oh, for sure. And so I'll come back to that humble mm. aspect. One thing that I picked up very quick from dad was dad would coach the team, but he would actually allow me at a very young age to, he was like, you know, you're really good at what you do here. So let's put you in a position where you're actually coaching. So I want you to lead some of these sessions and he'd ask for advice. But you know, that was just with me and dad, but he was doing that with lots of people. And so I think that was really powerful and something I learned quite quickly. You know, and I've got a good story with that one too, Craig. Um, I've got a, a colleague from the USA, uh, Rob Sleemaker, who is the CEO and founder of Vaza Trainers. Yeah. Um, and Rob sent me a, a personal message talking about his uh, mentor in uh, what they call um, grade school, so primary school um, in the Southern Hemisphere, and how his PE teacher had used uh, the leading students as mentors to the younger students and these sorts of things. And he was talking about uh, giving him this fantastic skill set for life going forward and the ability to teach and be humble and, and to learn was a really big part of his journey. So exactly what you're saying, your dad had given me the same opportunity. Yeah, we grew up in a farming community. So I think when I first went to primary school, there were 26 children from five years to 12 years old. And by the time I left, there were only seven and it actually finished that year, which was a real shame. But I think, you know, you're talking about that ability for the older ones to help the younger ones along the way was was really powerful and they're also close to our age too so they could speak out talk a little bit more um, so that was really good when I moved to Auckland Mark Bone uh, who was a former New Zealand swimming coach uh, worked with a number of triathletes um, has worked with a number of business people along the way and has an extremely successful learned to swim program in New Zealand and he he was a fantastic mentor for me he had the ability to push me, but also bring me back down to earth and go, you know, yes, you might want to go and be dealing with elite athletes, but let's get the basics right first. And you're doing well there, so let's make sure you just move through gradually rather than trying to go from step one to step 10 on the ladder. And we see that in the workplace too, where people have some skill sets and they want to go from being 
the person doing the sport development, for instance, so took from a sporting sense, and then they actually want to be a CEO uh, next year, which is it's just, just too quick. And I think those experiences are really important. And, you know, I suppose a good analogy is we see a lot of professional athletes now who come out of playing sport and they're fast-tracked into being head coaches of national teams. And I, I just don't, I think it's too quick. Yeah, and I think you've got to develop that experience. There, there needs to be a gestation through that period of time. And I think that's, that's the role of a true active CEO to recognise that and to um, create the platform and the pathways for um, employees to be the best they can be through your organisation. And to if you try and skip a few steps, there's always going to be weak points in the wall that you've built. Um, so once again, it's that being that proactive approach about how you, you do it rather than a reactive approach. Yeah. Reactive, if you've got to solve the problem because this person can't doesn't have the skill set to take care of this or whatever it happens to be, um, it's a fair reflection on the way that you've led your organisation. And now you you did something uh, pretty amazing. You got to work with athletes that won world championships, um, national titles, went on to the Olympics. And I'm sure during that time, you know, you are a CEO in a way. Absolutely. And so you're working long hours. And now, now talk a little bit about what a normal week would look like for a, an Olympic coach. So the week for an Olympic coach is really a seven-day proposition and you don't ever really clock off. And that's probably the problem with the, the Olympic level coaching. There's never any really downtime and, and you become addicted to um, trying to achieve that success. And that's ultimately the downfall of most Olympic level coaches. Uh, you, you essentially burn out really quickly and you only see Olympic level coaches in the cycle for either a four-year or an eight-year cycle. Um, so it's a real, um, a real black spot in our industry, I, I would think, because you're losing your very high-end coaches in a, in a four or an eight year. So it might take you 12 years to get to that Olympic level, and then you, you're cooked essentially after four, two, one or two Olympic cycles and you're gone. So you, they, the sport loses all the IP um, to that period of time. So it's, it's quite poor on our side of the fence, I think, and it's certainly something that as a sport as individual sports, they need to try and sort out a little bit. It's too, it's too much. And that's tra- seven days a week travel, you know, all these sorts of things. And that, and really the, um, the other side of the equation for that is um, it's quite poor pay. Oh. No, no one's really making much money out of it. Oh, I'm sure you'd be lower than the minimum pay per hour. Absolutely. So, so a big challenge, right? You, you, you're putting your whole life, your whole energy into either one or two or, or one team of athletes mm. who have got this very focused goal, very self-orientated. Incredible. And, you know, you had a young family. Mm. Yeah. So, so how, how did you balance that time of, you know, I need to focus to get high performance from out of an athlete and out of yourself as a coach with also having a wonderful wife and then, you know, later on the birth of your Daughter. Beautiful yep. daughter. Yep. Uh, the truth is that you have to communicate that, um, and it's a it's a partnership that you have to be enter into or you've entered into, and it's about open communication. It's about talking about your goals, uh, the commitments that go with those goals, uh, the things that you need to do to achieve those goals. But then there's a realization that you also have to give a little bit. There's a give and take type situation, and you have to you have to be disciplined enough to ensure that you're giving back to your relationship. Uh, it's an incredibly lonely life if you don't have a relationship as you go through there. And it can be done, but it's a very tough gig. And it's no different than being a CEO with its long hours. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Um, and the things that you're worried about are probably not the things that are an issue at home. So um, it's about the communications um, and it's about being a realist, I, I would have to say. I think it's, we, we put all that passion and time in, but, you know, I know sitting back now, you know, I've sort of stepped back from coaching the last few years and you you realise that you don't actually need to be there seven days a week yeah, and you absolutely. don't have to be at every single session. We, we kind of forget that they're not uh, robots or they're not kids. Like they actually can figure things out themselves. They will problem themselves by themselves they will learn without you being there. And I think a lot of coaches make that mistake. 
Uh, and, and you'd have to say the same. It would be with uh, same with CEOs too. Definitely. You know, you, you probably don't have to be there seven days a week to make your organisation run. I think if you communicate and you teach your staff and, and you have your structures in play, I think your organisation can quite ably be successful. It's all about empowering and providing that environment where there's trust and where they feel the confidence to be able to deliver. Yes, they're going to make mistakes, and I think we all make mistakes, that mate. Oh, of yeah. course, we're all we're all in the mistake category. That's all right. You learn from those and move on. Yeah, if you're not making mistakes, you're not you're not reaching, you're not growing, you're not learning. Yeah, and and certainly um, with that with the mistake situation, um, if we're not learning from those, but if you're if you're using those mistakes to continually discipline or chastise your employees, that's not going to last very long. You need to ensure that you sort the mistake out, you figure out how it's not going to happen the next time, and you move on. Oh, and you find this in both the workplace and in the sporting environment. If, Absolutely. If that connection's not there, the environment's not there, they're going to leave. Yeah. Um, I, I was lucky enough to, moving on from my triathlon um, Olympic coaching career, I was involved with the rugby organisation, rugby team, um, and there was a saying within the in the team that you had to fail fast, and that sort of seems a bit weird when you because not often in winning teams you talk about failing, but the truth in it is in a team sport, there's times where you just drop the ball or you miss a tackle or you don't see something that you should have seen, well you need to get over that quickly and move on. If the team's going to linger on those one or two mistakes over a period of time. It's going to bog the whole process down. It's no different than in the workplace. Yeah. Somebody's going to make a mistake. Yeah. You sort it out. You move on. You certainly don't hold that mistake against any employee, let alone a young employee or somebody that doesn't have the confidence. Your the role as CEO is to be in there and to lead and to help those people, not chastise and give them a boot. Oh yeah, it's, it's not how far you fall. It's how quickly you get back on your feet and you progress forward. And yeah, fail fast. It's, a, it's yeah. a really good point. Another take home there, failing fast. Mm. Now, just, I was reading your book, you know, Better Than Winning It. It's a fantastic book about your Olympic journey along with, you know, your athletes that you had and, and Simon Thompson was obviously the standout one there. So I'm just going to read a little excerpt from the book. Etched in my mind forever, that camera flash moment in time when my friend and best mate, Simon Thompson, crossed the finish line in 10th place at the 2004 Olympic Games. Seeing Simon torn, bloody, bruised, saturated, exhausted, and totally spent from his monumental effort, I had never felt such a mix of powerful emotions, all culminating in an overwhelming sense of pride. So tell you, what what made you write that? Uh, Well, that's a... That's a tough question. I'm not really sure I've been asked that before. Um, I've certainly had that feeling um, subsequent to that. And once again, it was in the rugby environment when we had been playing the semi-final and that the boys had given their all and, and had, we weren't successful in that game against one of the top New Zealand teams. And it was the same. They were, they were battled, they were bruised, they'd given it all, they were saturated, they were bloody. Um, and once again, I felt pride in these young men who had stood tall and had done everything that was asked of them. It was the same as Simon. Simon. Um, ultimately, we didn't win the race, um, and that was a really tough thing to swallow at the time. And even to this day, 15 years later, whatever it happens to be, really tough to swallow that, that you didn't win. But um, with maturity, you realise that there's more than just winning, and there's there's friendship, there's pride, uh, there's love, um, there's family all come into it. Um, so those those emotions on that day were very raw, it was a, a very, very tough thing to see um, and be part of, um, but it was certainly a special time for us and it made us as men. Oh. Yeah, and a you know, very powerful moment in your time. And, mm. and it's, it's mm. you know, you talk about that it is more than just winning. And, and I think sometimes in the workplace, it, we, all we do is focus on work and the deliverables and the outcomes and are we achieving our KPIs. 
It's more and than the f- end of the financial year. Oh, exactly. Yeah. We forget that there's opportunity to have friendships and grow and learn from each other and share really good laughs and good times. And I think getting that balance is, yeah. is, can be a challenge for a lot of people. They're, they either go too far towards it or they just put the, the wall up there, the barrier gets in the way of those really important aspects of life and shit, we're only, we're only here once. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of, if we move in, go back to the sporting analogy, a lot of teams are, are starting to cotton on to the fact it's, don't talk about the result, it's about the process. Let's work through the process and if we do the process correct, we'll have the best result we can do. Now, if that result's not winning, well, so be it. And I don't think it's too differently in the workplace. I think if we focus on the process of what we're trying to deliver, so whether you're trying to sell cars or insurance or whatever your business is doing, it's about working the process and making sure your team, your people, are doing the very best they can do in the process. And I can guarantee if you're doing the very best process, the outcome's going to be okay. If you're worrying about what the bottom line is going to be at the end of the financial year and you're not concentrating on the process, you can guarantee the bottom line is not going to be very good. And I think, you know, that's probably where I, I learned and came to through my career and then writing the book Better Than Winning. I didn't have that title when I started. I, I wrote the book and I thought long and hard. It was a real, um, you know, realisation for me as a, as a young man and as a professional person that you go, to, you go through these, these journeys and it is better than the bottom line. It is better than winning the Olympic gold medal. It is better than the end of year financial result. Why was that? Because I made these lifelong connections. I inspired and got to lead young people. It's no different in the workplace. To be able to inspire and lead people within your workplace and make them better, that's got to be a better result. And I can tell you, if you do that well, the bottom line at the end of the financial year is going to be A number one. I'd like you to share why you know, how the book actually came about because I think this is a, a very important lesson that people can learn, uh, especially in the workplace. Yep. Yeah, so it's, the, the book was quite interesting. I, I, um, I was a professional coach. Um, I'd never written a book. I was an avid reader, but uh, it wasn't something I ever thought I would do. And post the Olympic journey, doing a little bit of soul searching I thought I'd I'd better actually write a little bit about this to my daughter who was um, might have been eight years old at that stage knowing that when she got old enough to understand um, I would probably sort of forgotten a little bit not really want to talk about too much so I thought well I'll just write her a letter Um, so uh, that paragraph that you read out there was the first um, first paragraph that I'd written and my intentions were just to write to her about what we had done. It was such a massive part of my life. It formed me as a person, as a man, as a professional going forward. Uh, So that was the origins of it. And um, I think, I don't know if I actually know, that I I wrote a fair bit and showed it to my wife. And she was like, oh my goodness, you know, this, this is really powerful. It's beautiful. You know, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Maybe you should just continue on writing a book about it. It's like, Sure. And that's, that's how it originated. Yeah. It's really cool. And it's a family. It's a family. To me, it was family. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't see you early in your career, but I, when I first arrived in Canberra, I did see you when you were working at the Brumbies and, and working some extremely long hours. But I still recall you saying, you know, I ride to work. Yeah. And, and that balance is massive for anybody, mate. And I know that you do the same. I know you're an avid golfer and... And you really take the time to not only play the game, but play the game well, because you have pride in how you play the game, um, and you have pride in your performance. And it's not, it doesn't mean winning, but you take pride in what you do. And to me, that's a massive thing. And was that something that was quite evident throughout the whole organisation, or you know, was it something that you led along the way? Uh, in the football organisation, I would have to say that we could do better on this. We could definitely do better. Um, and that's something that I know um, that particular organisation works quite hard on now. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do. I acknowledge that. Yeah. Oh. It's not an easy thing at all. Yeah, and were you able to switch off? Like, were you able to go, there's a clear line, there's the boundary of this is working for the Brumbies 
and this is my home life? Uh, look, in, in truth, and I think every true leader will say this, probably not. You try very hard and you might um, put on a pretty good front, uh, but you're, you're continually, you know, one quarter of the time when you're at home still thinking about how we're going to achieve this certain task or whatever it happens to be in three quarters. So, uh, you know, to me, in hindsight, looking back, um, you, you have to be very diligent on being engaged at home. Um, and that's, that's a very important thing to me. Um, and I think we can all continue to get better at that. That's, yeah, those, those sort of environments, it's no different than any pressure. I, I can't imagine what the pressure would be like in a hospital environment uh, or emergency services environment or anything, any uh, high-end type jobs like that. The, the pressure, the time, um, the single focus, very hard to let go of. So, Craig... End of episode one, we've spoken uh, at length about our life experiences and some of the things that have really brought us on our journeys as active CEOs. Uh, I know that you're very proud um, and very humbled about bringing this to the table. That's certainly something I've been very keen on too. Yeah, we're here to make a difference to people's lives. And you know, we see a lot of CEOs and leaders that you know, are pushing the boundaries and you know, aren't always producing that high performance they're desiring. So it was good to share some of our life experiences and evolve that into Active CEO. Part two of our Active CEO podcast, Craig, we're going to bring to the table some uh, discussions about periodization and how you can uh, achieve more through periodization. A big one for me, more about being proactive or reactive to the situations in the workplace. Needing to spend energy to get energy. I think that's something that people don't realize, you know, they're trying to push the boundaries and they're always doing lots of more, more, more work. Uh, so we're going to talk about how you need to actually do a bit of energy there first before you'll increase your performance. We'll talk about a little bit more about the work-life balance and also about being humble. Thanks for your time, everyone. We look forward to seeing you back for part two of Active CEO. Join the Active CEO movement by visiting www.nrgtoperform.com. That's N-R-G number two perform.com. Share this podcast on LinkedIn and be sure to tag in NRG to perform. Leave a review on iTunes. Drop us a line with your feedback and questions and connect with us on the NRG to perform Facebook and Instagram pages. Be sure to check out the next Active CEO podcast where the ordinary don't belong.